Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. It's day 651 of our three-year journey through the Word of God. We're coming to the end of Nehemiah now. I have coffee. I have my fun uh, drink coffee, do stupid things faster with more energy mug. Um, thank you to those who gave that to me. Nehemiah chapter 13 is on tap for today. The final reforms of Nehemiah as governor of Jerusalem and Judea. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would speak to us today through your word and write it on our hearts and cause our hearts to move toward you in love for all that you are and all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah chapter 13. On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God, for they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of the God, of God, of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time, I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And I then discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry, and I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders, and they cleansed the chamber, and I brought back there the vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurer over the storehouses Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Padeah of the Levites, and as their assistant Hanan, the son of Zachar, son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable, and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. In those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of loads which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them on the day when they sold food. Tyrians also, who lived in the city, brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the people of Judah and in Jerusalem itself. Then I confronted the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this evil thing that you are doing, profaning the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers act in this way? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Now you are bringing more wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. As soon as it began to grow dark, at the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut, and gave orders that they should not be opened until after the Sabbath. And I stationed some of my servants at the gates, that no load might be brought in on the Sabbath day. Then the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. But I warned them and said to them, Why do you lodge outside the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time on, they did not come on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come and guard the gates to keep the Sabbath day holy. Remember this also in my favor, O my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. In those days also, I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, 
and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, and they could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. And I confronted them, and cursed them, and beat some of them, and pulled out their hair, and I made them take an oath in the name of God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, or take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin on account of such women? Among the many nations there was no king like him, and he was beloved by his God, and God made him king over Israel. Nevertheless, foreign women even made him to sin. Shall we then listen to you, and do all this great evil, and act treacherously against God by marrying foreign women? And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. Then I chased him from me. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have desecrated the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleansed them from everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites, each in his work. And I provided for the wood offering at appointed times and for the first fruits. Remember me, O my God, for good. So there's Nehemiah's uh, end of his book, um, which was largely written by Nehemiah, but then probably compiled together and put together with Ezra, as it seems to be one volume. Uh, and Ezra, Ezra as the scribe, seems to be the editor hand at work there. Anyway, we finally find out uh, why it is that Sanballat and Tobiah have had such influence and have been able to cause so much trouble. You know, you may have been all the time in the book of Nehemiah, like, who are these guys? Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah? Why are they so much trouble, and how can they... Well, they're connected to the highest-ranking priests. So, uh, one of the sons of Jehoiada, who's the son of Eliashib the priest, well, he's the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite. We find that at the end of the chapter. And then if you remember, back at the beginning of the chapter, Eliashib, so the, the, the priest himself, he was related to Tobiah. So Sanballat and Tobiah had married into the highest levels of the priestly family. Now, this is an interesting bit of foreshadowing here in Nehemiah 13. That causes trouble. That causes defiling. What's going to happen later in the future when Herod, the Hasmonean, when Herod, sorry, when Herod, who is an Idumean, he's an Edomite, and he wants to establish his legitimacy in Judea and Jerusalem, he marries into and, and, and uh, the, the priest's family, the high priest's family. And so there's marriage alliances between Herod, who's this puppet king under the Romans, and the high priest's family. And that causes all sorts of corruption. And it's not surprising that the priests are so corrupt that they decide that they need to put Jesus on trial. They look the other way when Herod carries out an infanticide in Bethlehem, explicitly trying to kill the Messiah. And then they conspire together to have the Messiah killed 30 years later. So this kind of corruption is all too common in among human beings. Remember back in chapter 10, I said that we need to make sure we don't get caught up and begin to think that, oh, these people are making this wonderful covenant before the Lord. And this is going to be so wonderful because it really is trying to sort of establish salvation by the law, by human oath keeping, by human promise keeping. And that doesn't work because human beings are sinful and selfish and don't keep their word. Well, here's the evidence. Nehemiah 13, go back and look at Nehemiah 10 again. You line them up to each other and everything that they resolved that they were going to do, that they so solemnly covenanted together, here they're not doing it. Remember they said, we will not neglect the house of our God. We will make sure that we're going to do that. Well, here we see they're not giving the tithes to the Levites. And so the Levites are having to leave, taking care of the house of God and farm the fields because they can't eat if they don't receive the tithe. Remember they said, we're not going to let anybody do any business on the Sabbath day. That's not going to happen. Well, they were letting foreigners come in and sell and trade on the Sabbath day. And remember they said, we're going to put away the foreign women. We're not going to have any foreign women among us. Well, they broke that too. And so Nehemiah, he, he went away for a time to be back with the king and with Artaxerxes back in uh, Persia, or king of Babylon, Babylon, part of the Persian Empire. And then he comes back 
and he just has to clean house. It's literally clean house. He has to clean out the house of God from the, the large room that was given to Tobiah because he was a relative of the priest. And Tobiah, who'd caused all this trouble for years, he's given a room in the temple. That, a room that's reserved for the things of God is being given to an enemy of God. This is like horrible. But we see this today. We see within the church of Jesus Christ, which is the temple of the living God, which is the body of Christ, we see within the visible church, we see people come in who are enemies of God's people, who are there just to extort, to, to, to con people, to sell things, to promote their own name and their own glory. And it's disgusting. And it is just not surprising, but not good either. I'll just leave it at that, right? So here's, here's Nehemiah having to do this reform again and again and again. One of the things that we need to learn is that because we are human beings, because we are prone to wander, because we are sinful in our nature and still have remnants of abiding sin even after our regeneration, we need continual reform. We need continual reform, continual renewal, we need the Lord to work and shape us after his image, after his likeness. We need him to call us away from the world. We need him to grant us repentance. We need him every day of our lives. Let's pray. Father, it's only your grace, only the work of your Holy Spirit, only the reforming work of your spirit working through your word stirring up the hearts of your people that keeps us repenting again and again and turning back from the world back to you again and again. It's what we need to do. The world and its siren song of commercialism and, and sexual immorality and lust and self-promotion and, and self-satisfying, uh, it, it's just a lie and it's such a trap and we're so prone to give into it. Forgive us, renew us, restore us, Revive us, lead us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that is Nehemiah chapter 13. Tomorrow, we're going to be in the Psalms, Lord willing, Psalms 95 and 96. Hope you can join me for that. As always, I do hope you have a blessed day in the Lord.